الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا الحمد لله الذي انزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله ارسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وان كل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد ان اقول اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الا ان اولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون الذين امنوا وكانوا يتقون لهم البشرى في الحياه الدنيا وفي الاخره لا تبديل لكلمات الله ذلك هو الفوز العظيم اللهم اجعلنا من الفائزين واللهم اجعلنا من اولياء الله الذين لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين Today's khutbah is at one level very simple but at another can be very complicated I ask Allah azza wa jalla to give me clarity in speech so I'm able to communicate uh, these teachings that reflect the the message of the Quran uh, in a way that is balanced so I'll start by talking to you a little bit about the importance of balance in delivering and in understanding a message sometimes you see something wrong and you point out that it's wrong and when you point out that it's wrong you can go to the other extreme so in correcting something wrong maybe 80% of it is wrong 20% of it there's nothing wrong with it right but in in over correcting now you're even making something that has nothing wrong with it also wrong so we have to have a balanced approach when we criticize something that there is some element of truth in it and that's not what's being criticized the same way when you praise something you can't over praise you can something may be 50% praiseworthy and the other 50% isn't we have to be precise and balanced in our approach we're living in a time where um things become 100% or 0% all too quickly if someone is wrong everything about them is wrong if an idea is wrong every tenet of that idea is wrong Uh, so people have to choose sides, and when they choose sides, all the nuances and all the pieces of that puzzle that may not have anything wrong with them also have to become wrong because you have to show your loyalty to this side or the other. We have to have everything figured out as black and white, and it doesn't work like that. Sometimes there's a lot of gray in the middle, and the Quran is very sophisticated in that it addresses things that are wrong in very precise ways. And what is not wrong in something, Allah does not criticize. Allah does not just make blanket statements. So that's one kind of caveat a disclaimer that I wanted to make myself mindful of and all of you mindful of in um in, in before I enter into this topic uh, on its own and just to give you an idea how this can work for example if somebody's talking about modesty and what is modest behavior and they point out one or two things that a person should do in order to engage in modest behavior and a person can overreact and say well are you saying I can't do anything is everything impossible so they take one or two things that are not allowed and then they over react and say well you're saying all of it is wrong or none of it is acceptable etc etc right so this is this is a, a delicate topic um a sensitive one but a really important one in the quran and the way to start with this uh with this subject is to actually describe how what was given by allah to all of the prophets and the perfection of it given to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the final messenger is something actually pretty revolutionary what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given is extremely revolutionary why is it revolutionary because you know you have in religions across the world before islam or the the what used to be the religion of truth or the twisted versions of a religion whether they are the ancient egyptian religions whether they have to do with china whether they have to do with the indian religions whether they have to it doesn't matter which religion you're talking about there was a consistent theme among many and one of those themes was you don't have a direct connection to the divine you have to go through someone to make the divine happy whether you have to go through a saint 
whether you have to go through a holy person, whether you have to go through someone who is priestly, they have a connection to the unseen. You don't. You need to go to them to get your prayers answered, to get your wishes met. You need to make some kind of sacrifice to this sub-god to make the ultimate god happy. There's always an intermediary. There's always someone in between that has to be pleased. And so these people in between become holy. They're holy people. They're sacred people. They're, you know, if, if they're happy with you, then God or whatever divine being you believe in is happy with you. If they're not happy with you, then God is not happy with you. So they become sort of ambassadors of the ultimate divine being. And in doing so, they become almost like the, the manifestation of the divine on earth. So we can't see God. We can't see the ultimate power. But we see his representatives here, these authorized people on his behalf. They're the holy people. They're the sacred people. They're the saints, right? And these saints, this, this concept became a means of terrible corruption in the world. Because when you hand someone this power and you say, this person, at the end of the day, all human beings are created equal. We believe that. And it seems like a pretty simple thing to say. But actually, this is not the belief of a lot of humanity across history. Human beings did not, were not believed to be created equal. Some people were believed to be created superior. Or they're partly divine. They're higher and holier than everyone else. They're on a different, they're on a different caliber. You can't touch them. You can't ever reach their status. And because they had this status, they're beyond criticism. You can't say anything about them. You can't question any of their behavior. And whatever they say is the same as God himself speaking. That's actually the case. They, you can't question them. Questioning them is questioning God himself or questioning the ultimate authority themselves. They have all the answers. So when they tell you something, you don't have the, the right to think for yourself and say, no, that doesn't make sense. They will do the thinking for you. They will tell you what you need to do, what you shouldn't do. If you want to be successful, do this, this, this. If you want this wish answer, do this, this, this. Follow these, these, these rituals. They will have the prescription for life. These intermediaries were set up in different cultures and different societies around the world. And sometimes these took the form of idols. If not people, it took the form of idols. Idols also represented people that died a long time ago. And now their memory is this idol, right? And so you come to this statue and you, you uh, make wishes to it, even though you know this statue is not a living being, it represents the soul or the spirit of someone who's connected to a higher power, right? And this whole setup is a really good scheme because this way, the people who are supposedly holier, they can make a lot of money and they, can, they have a lot of power. They can tell people to do whatever they want them to, tell, they want to say and yield whatever control in society they want. They can get away with all kinds of things because when they do something, they can't be told you did right or you did wrong because whatever they do is God's ordained will, right? So they're beyond reproach, beyond criticism. Then comes the true message of religion, which is the, the religion of this, this deen Islam, which was given to all the prophets. And again, the perfection of it to our messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which destroys the idea of anyone in between. And how does it destroy that idea? First of all, every human being is a slave directly of Allah. You don't go through anyone. In fact, you don't even go through a prophet. A prophet is not telling you, you know, make me happy and I'll put in a word to God. I'll put in a word with Allah. That's not what prophets are saying. Prophets are simply saying, Be mindful of Allah yourselves and follow what I'm doing. Meaning, follow me as in I'm being mindful of Allah. So learn how to be mindful of Allah by following my way. So they're actually not calling themselves. You know, how many times our messenger has been told ayat like these? You know, I'm in ana illa you know, bashar. I'm nothing but a human being. I'm just another person. Yuha ilayya. You know, qul innama ana bashar mithlukum yuha ilayya in surah al-kahf. I'm just a, just a slave, just a human being, just like you. The only difference is revelation was given to me. What's that revelation? Annama ilahukum ilahun wahid. Your God is a single God. In other words, he's not even asking people to deify him. Now notice the difference. Our messenger, sallallahu his status, we know. We can't even say his name without saying sallallahu alayhi wa But when he was sitting in a gathering, you couldn't tell which one is the prophet. In fact, people used to walk in sometimes and not know, and they would start showing respect to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And you know, hey, wrong address, this is over there. You know, and they wanted to put some kind of a, a throne or some kind of a special seat. 
you know, so he's a little bit higher and he refused the throne. So they actually put a dirt mound. So the dirt is a little higher than the one he's sitting on. Now compare this to people that are ordained or considered holy in whatever, whatever temple or um, church or whatever other setup, right? In any other religion, you'll notice the holy person when they walk in, everybody knows who that is. They got a different outfit. They look like they look different. They expect a different reaction from everyone. So when people come in, they want to kiss their hands. Everybody's kind of, you know, bowing down, you know, and they have this, this royal garb and they have almost like a throne where they sit and people come before them like they come before a king. They have this high and holy status. And this is something Islam completely rejected by even the way the Prophet ﷺ carried himself, the way that he walked and talked throughout his career as a messenger. There's no special clothing for him. There's no special ring or special, you know, demarcation, special cloak. He's dressed like everybody else. He's, he's eating like everybody else. There's no special food for him, you know. But you, what you have in certain religions is when the holy person arrives, nobody can touch the food until he takes the first bite. Or nobody better, you better not sit down before you kiss his hand. Or before you, you know, you show some kind of humility to this person. If there was ever a person that we should show humility to, it would have been Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You understand that, right? But at, what's happened in religions around the world, and the crazy thing, this is the part that makes this difficult to talk about, is this happened in the Muslim culture. Islam came to get rid of this idea that certain people are more sacred than others. And the Prophet ﷺ in his last sermon, his last khutbah said that all of us, the, our colors don't make a difference. The colors of our skin don't make a difference. The only thing that puts one in a place higher than anyone else is taqwa in the heart. So the, the only way one person is better than the other is the taqwa of Allah. And where is the taqwa? Allah has, describes it himself. That is something that taqwa that lies inside the hearts. It's inside the heart. Now, here's the fun thing. No human being has been given the ability to look inside another human being's heart. So if taqwa is inside the heart, there's no way for me to know if you have taqwa or not. And there's no way for you to know if I have taqwa or not. It doesn't matter if I'm praying tahajjud or reciting Quran all day or going to hajj every year or I look a certain way, I have a certain appearance that makes me look. There's a taqwa outfits nowadays, right? There's a person that looks at taqwa, they've got, they've got a taqwa face. They've got taqwa headgear, right? They've got taqwa vocabulary. So when they, when they say those kinds of words or they look that kind of way, male or female, then that is a person of taqwa. It's like we've got taqwa costumes, you know? And if, if, you, if you look this way, then you're sacred. If you don't look this way, I mean, come on. I realized how serious this is in our culture, in, in, across Muslim cultures, how serious this issue is. We, we take it lightly, but I think it is a very serious thing because it cuts up one of the most fundamental teachings of our religion. When I first started getting involved in giving khutbah many, many years ago, I decided that I, I was influenced by certain people who said that you, if you dress in like, a suit and a tie, or you dress like Western clothing, a t-shirt or shirt, whatever. This is the way the kuffar dress. This is not the way of the Muslims. This is not the way of the salihin, et cetera, et cetera. You should dress like, you know, the, the Muslims. And the, the idea of dressing like the Muslims was dressing like an Arab. And not the Arab of ancient times, because they didn't wear thobes like we wear now. You understand? They, if they wore thobes then, they couldn't ride a horse. You understand that, right? And you don't run in a battlefield with thobes like these. How are you going to run? These steps? How are you going to run in a battlefield with a sword? That's, that's not what they wore back then. But we have this cultural thing that if you're more Islamic, you're going to dress a certain way. And I was influenced by that. So I had a turban and I had a thobe and I had the whole look, you know, the whole... I, I, when I used to, in Long Island, I walk out sometimes and some people say, man, oh my, that guy looked like Jesus. Like I got that sometimes, right? But you know what happened? I would give a khutbah and I was like 23 years old. And I'm giving a khutbah. And I'm not a holy person. But people are, elder men are coming up to 60, 70 year old men, 80 year old men are coming up to me, trying to kiss my hand, trying to get me shaky, almost in ruku, trying to shake my hand, and then bringing their children to me to, for me to pat their heads and to make dua for them. And I got disturbed by this entire scene. Like, man, I'm going to finish khutbah, pray my sunnah, and I'm going to play basketball with some guys outside. And then we're going to go eat some pizza. Like, I'm just a regular person who just
happened to give this khutbah because I was asked to give a khutbah. I'm not a holy saint or whatever you guys are making me out to be, right? Pretty soon I'm going to be wearing a t-shirt and, you know, some sneakers and astaghfirullah al -Azim. But the, 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 the garb was actually enough for someone to say, oh my God, this is a, oh, someone of taqwa just walked in. Like there's so much noor around. That's not noor, bro. That's just a costume. That's just clothes. And I'm not criticizing Arab clothing or a turban or none of those things. But those clothings belong to a culture. Listen, if you lived in the time of the Prophet, if there was a time machine and you traveled immediately right from right now to Mecca, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and Abu Jahal came out of his house with a beard, with a thobe, with a turban on, you would say, MashaAllah, Shaykh. That's because that's what you, that's what they look like. They, but we have this thing about a certain appearance is actually holy, and another kind of appearance isn't. Clothing doesn't matter which culture it comes from; doesn't determine whether or not you have taqwa. The clothing clothing in our religion has guidelines. There's no guidelines. Don't dress like an American. Don't dress like an Australian. Don't dress like a you know, Canadians are kind of okay. And you know, <laughs> you know, dress. And so that the guidance of Allah, the guidelines, what is awra, what should be covered, what, what, what conditions should be met, those conditions are met. Now dress. Dress in a Chinese outfit. Dress in a Bengali outfit. Dress in an American. Who cares? The conditions are met. Islam came to liberate us from artificial standards of holiness. And the only one who determines where you stand. Quran says openly. Don't declare yourselves holy and sacred and pure. He knows better who has taqwa. If Allah says, We say this phrase all the time, right? Allahu a'lam, Allahu a'lam, Allahu a'lam. Allahu a'lam means, I don't know, only Allah knows. Allah says, He is the one who knows better who has taqwa. So I don't get to say that you have it more or I have it more. Somebody who has more knowledge doesn't mean they have more taqwa. Someone who's memorized more Quran doesn't mean they have more taqwa. In fact, this is not so you can put down people. Hey, just because you're a hafiz doesn't mean you have taqwa. Okay, I heard a khutbah about that. You're you in nothing. <laughs> no, no, no. This is the other way. When you see someone and you they don't look the part. They don't look holy to you. They don't look like a mullah or a mulana or a sheikh or whatever. They don't look like they don't have that outfit. Then you and I can't assume this person has taqwa. I wish they had taqwa. Because if they had the ancient outfit on, then they would, they would be more Islamic. right? So appearances became very important to us. And this is actually another form of creating people between us and Allah. Why? Because what we did next, not only did we consider certain people that look a certain way or act a certain way or associated a certain way, we considered those people holier. Then we figured that our du'as and our decisions for our life are worthless because these are the holy people. So they should decide for us. We should ask them what we should do. We should ask them to make du'a for us because our du'a is pointless. Sheikh, please make du'a for me. You, you know, you're, you, mashallah, you're such a person of, you know, adarab and remembering Allah Azza wa You have such a high maqam. You have such a high, did you check my heart to see what station I have, what maqam I have? You don't, you don't know anybody else's maqam. How do you know someone else's dua is more sacred for you? Because we have this assumption that some people are holier than others. And, and you know, the crazy part is that some people really like it. <laughs> they like being considered holy. They like being considered elevated status. So they'll, they'll walk in, and I've seen this with my own eyes, and I'm personally disgusted by it. They'll walk, and they'll have students or people that consider them a mentor, and they're walking behind them with their, with their shoes or with their bag, half in ruku or like this, like an entourage, the holy person, and then the, the people behind them. Like, what, what is this? And I was in a gathering of such, I won't name people, I was in a, such a gathering one time, and the person came and they sat down, and everybody, one by one, went to kiss their hands, and it looked like when the Pope visits someplace, right? And I was like, yeah, no, I don't know if he washed them first. I'm not, I'm not doing that. So I was like, so I'm like, oh, how's it going? But normal conversation. And the people that were saying, oh, what? can you do that? People talked to the Messenger of Allah directly, didn't they? 
strangers would come up to him and talk to him. And here you have a person who expect he'll even stick his hand out. Hey, you didn't pay your respects. Is this the mafia? You, you, you didn't kiss the ring? You know? And they, they, this, this culture gets created and then it goes to other extremes. What extremes can it go to? It can go to a point where these things turn into cults. I don't know. I can't name my baby because I didn't ask my holy sheikh. They didn't, they didn't you know, check with the divine to say, what, what should I name my child? Should I, should I marry this person or divorce this person? Should I do this? Should I do that? All major decisions. This person's making major decisions in your life for you because you've handed them this authority that somehow they're connected to the higher power, which is no different than the priests in ancient Egypt that used to answer people's omen questions. It's no different. It's just an Islamic outfit, but that, that's, it's the same exact thing. It's the same exact kind of intermediary between you and Allah that Islam came to destroy. And then if even if people don't go to the level where they are worshipping them or considering them divinely connected, then there's lesser forms of this. And the lesser forms of this are, okay, so somebody benefited from learning from, a, from an imam or from a teacher. Let's just even take, I'll take my own example. Somebody benefited from learning from me. If anybody, if, uh, and I have many students, but if anybody's a serious student of mine, they know one thing for sure. They know one thing for very, very sure. I tell them before I'm anything else, I'm a student myself. I tell them when you find something more convincing, you go with it. I tell them I'm not offended that you're learning from someone else or you're learning something that contradicts what I taught you because you have to follow the truth, not a person. You should benefit from every teacher you possibly can. But no one is beyond mistake. No one is beyond criticism. And even when you criticize, now all this time I'm telling you these people aren't holy, I'm not holy, nobody else is holy. That doesn't mean they're, they're not worthy of respect either. You, I mean, remember I said in the beginning balance? So the other extreme happens, oh, none of these people are worth anything. So <laughs> you know what? We owe each other a common respect. A common respect. In fact, for me, as controversial as, as, as it might sound, anybody who's ever taught me anything, whether they're Muslim or not, whether they're Hindu, whether they're an atheist, whether they're a Christian, whether they're an Islamic scholar, anybody who's ever taught me anything, I have lifelong respect for. I just have respect for them. Because knowledge itself is sacred. Now that person may do things I don't agree with. They may have other ideas I don't agree with. But even my disagreements never take away my respect for them. But my, my appreciation of them never makes them into a holy figure for me that no matter what they say is right either. There's a balance. And that balance is pretty common sense. But unfortunately, in many cultures, this common sense disappears. And cults are formed. These sacred people then tell you, we will tell you what you should listen to and not listen to. We will tell you what is halal for you and what is haram for you. We will tell you what is right for you. You don't think for yourself, the shaykh is thinking for you. With that in mind, the, the, the topic of this khutbah was, who are the friends of Allah? Why? Because this is one of the most abused, in my opinion, abused terms in our, in our culture. Awliyaullah, awliya. The people that are friends of Allah. We use this term in our culture for... You know, in Urdu they say bhot panchevi personality, bhot panchevi logan. In other words, they're like they've got some high status. They are so close to Allah. They're like on the 150th floor. You live in the basement. They're way more connected to Allah than you are. So, man, you can never reach their level, right? Those are the awliya of Allah. So when they walk in, you should just humble yourself and you should, you know, run to get their whatever divine wisdom they have to drop on you, right? So listen to how Allah describes awliya Allah, and that, this is what I'll conclude my khutbah with today. Allah Azza wa Jal says, and I will get to the ayah at the end. This is ayah actually, ayah number 62 and 63 of Surah Yunus, right? But I'm going to start a little bit further back and briefly translate so you can see what the argument being built here is by Allah Azza wa Jal. So first he talks about the Quran. Very famous ayah, I've talked about it before. Humanity, people listen up. A counsel has come to you from your master. A healing for what lies inside the hearts. And a guidance and a mercy and a loving care for believers. Meaning the Quran is there to heal you directly. You don't need someone else to heal your heart. You don't need someone else to cure you of your diseases. Allah has given you his word directly. You have direct access to it. You don't need anybody else. Tell them by the favor of Allah alone and by his loving care alone. 
Because of that, they should be overjoyed. It is better than anything that they gather. Tell them. Have you taken, have you observed what Allah has sent down to you of all kinds of risk? Meaning food, clothing, money. This is all risk in our life. Have you ever thought about the risk Allah has sent down to you? And you made up your own versions of haram and halal for it? How dare you? Allah, Allah provided you and you, you come up with your own rules? What is Allah? Allah first mentioned Quran, His revelation. Then He said, how dare you make up your own rules, right? What's He telling us? If you ever want to figure out what's halal and haram, where do you go? You go to Allah's word. You don't go somebody else is defining for you what you should and shouldn't do. What is halal for you and what's not haram? What's, what, what's haram for you? Did Allah authorize you? Tell, ask them, did Allah authorize you? Are you making these things up yourself? You know, these people, I've even seen TV shows in Muslim countries, TV shows. People call it, you know, I'm having a problem with my, my uncle. He keeps, do, you know, this, that, the other. He's giving me a really hard time. He's not giving me my share in the inheritance. What should I do? He says, hold on. Read this ayah. 43 times while standing on a chair on one leg facing the window in the east, your uncle will die. <laughs> what do you guys come up with this stuff? Maybe I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but might as well. Tell him to do the hokey pokey and your problems will get solved. You know, you're coming up with all kinds of made up prescriptions for what is right for you, what is wrong for you. I mean, they'll even tell him, stop eating chicken. Your, your marriage is falling because you're eating chicken. What? What? <laughs> You know, so this this thing is being critiqued, and he says, What what is going to be what are going to be the thoughts of those who made up these lies against Allah on, judge, on Resurrection Day? I love this part of the ayah. He says, Allah has possessed a great favor for all people. Allah has given so much favor to people, but people aren't grateful. Allah, is, Allah did you such a huge favor to you that He spoke to you directly. You don't need to go through someone to talk to Allah. He spoke to you directly. That entire scheme of religion as a means of control and manipulation got destroyed by the word of Allah. And here you are going back to that. You aren't even grateful for what you've been given. SubhanAllah. He says, he tells the Prophet first, and whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever Quran you recite, and then he turns to all of us and says, and whatever, you, you have never done any deed of any kind. There's not a single act you've ever done, except that we've been a witness over you. We've been watching over you. No saint is watching over you. No shaykh is watching over you. Allah is watching over you before anyone else. إِنَّا كُنَّا عَلَيْكُمْ شُهُدًا When you're deeply immersed in that act, there's nothing in the skies and the earth in the in the earth and the skies there's not a deed you know of even the worth of a, a, a microscopic dot or even something smaller or bigger except it does it never gets overlooked by Allah <laughs> it's not like it Allah didn't notice it now I need to go to someone else to figure out what to do Everything is under Allah's observation. Then he says, So simple. How do I become a wali of Allah? Well, here's a 1,000 step process. No, in the Quran, it's not a 1,000 step process. It's a two step process. He says, you had better know the friends of Allah, the protective friends of Allah, they will have no fear on them. They will not be sad. How do I become a friend of Allah? Simple. الَّذِينَ amanu وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ They came to the faith, they came to believe in Allah and His Messenger and His revelations, and then they continuously, كَانَ يَتَّقِي كَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ كَانَ فَاسْ مُضَارَةً Continuous. They kept on engaging in taqwa. They kept on being mindful of Allah. They became mindful of Allah when they could have cheated at work. They became mindful of Allah when they could have lied about something. They became mindful of Allah when they guarded their eyes. They became mindful of Allah when they held back from saying something terrible. They became mindful of Allah when they chose not to backbite against somebody. They became mindful of Allah when they could have responded with an insult and they responded with kindness instead. They became mindful of Allah over and over and over. These are the people that are the friends of Allah. 
And these people could be wearing a t-shirt. They don't have to have a turban on. The, these people could, you know, be a high school kid. They don't have to have a white beard. They could be the awliya of Allah. Allah did not put a high, like, holy, sacred standard for what does it mean to be Allah's friend. He made it so fundamental and simple. And that is the revolution of Islam. That is actually revolutionary. Anybody can be the friend of Allah with meeting some very basic requirements. There is no additional requirements. These people will have good news in this life and in the next life. Done. There's no more, no further requirements. Uh, iman and taqwa. And what did I tell you about iman and taqwa? Only you can know where you stand. Only I can know where I stand. Nobody else can judge that for us. So I pray we don't become victims to, you know, popifying and creating, you know, you know, artificial sacredness and supporting that kind of artificial sacredness. We should benefit from people that know more than us. We should learn from scholars, learn from people that have better character than we do, learn from their manners, learn from their adab. All of that should continue. But for not for a single moment should we consider anyone in a place where we, we assume they have a higher taqwa than the rest of us. This is not what we do for ourselves and we don't do this for others because it leads to many, many, many problems. And it takes us away from the actual spirit and message of the Quran. May Allah Azza make us the, the kinds of thinkers and the kinds of muttaqeen and the kinds of believers that Allah wants us to be in light of His Word. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim.